long as there's space up there, you might want to go up there. Oh, they're going to Yeah, sure. Yeah. How they do TED Talks, right? <laughs> okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this joint meeting of the Geographical Sciences Committee and the Mapping Sciences Committee, with our topic today being the Federal Landscape of Geographical and Mapping Sciences. Um, we're happy to see all of you who are here in the room with us, and we're glad that a number of people were able to join us online. So as a uh, note to the people in the room, I will say, remember that we are not the entire group, and please do use a microphone when you speak. Um, for those in the room, the exit for this meeting, if you should have, if there should be need for exit, is the door you you came in, and the restrooms are down the hall. We're really delighted to have all, all of you here with us today, and I think what we're going to do first is to just do a pretty quick round of introductions. We have two committees here from the National Academies, and we have a number of people in the room. We'll first go around the table, and it would be nice if you would just say your name and your institutional affiliation, and then we'll pass a microphone around the rest of the room. So why don't we begin up in the front? Well, let's, let's begin with Bill Selecki, and then we'll go across to Marion around this way. Um, Bill Selecki, uh, geographer, uh, City University of New York, Hunter College. Hi, Mary Molesky, National Weather Service. I'm the Chief of the Water Resources Services Branch. Burl Mons, Geographer at East Carolina University. Uh, Sandra Knight, Consulting, Water Walks is my company. Good morning, I'm Deirdre Bishop. I'm the Chief of the Geography Division at the United States Census Bureau. Hi, I'm Grady Toole. I have a company, 3D Ideas. I specialize in uh, design and manufacture of LIDAR systems. Martha Wells, Spatial Focus. I specialize in addressing systems and addressing development. Mark Raker with Open Geospatial Consortium. We're focused on interoperability and innovation in geospatial. Budu Bhadri, pretending to be a geographer. <laughs> Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Kathleen Stewart, Professor of Geographical Sciences, University of Maryland College Park, and Director of the Center for Geospatial Information Science. Center. Nancy Jackson, New Jersey Institute of Te Technology. I am also a geographer. Ann Lynn, National Academy staff. I'm Harvey Miller, Professor of Geography and Director of the Center for Urban Regional Analysis at The Ohio State University, and I chair the Mapping Science Committee. I'm Carol Harden. I chair the Geographical Sciences Committee. I'm Professor Emerita of Geography at the University of Tennessee. Good morning, I'm Kara Laney. I'm a staff officer here with the National Academies. Uh, Glenn McDonald, Department of Geography, University of California, Los Angeles, and I'm on the Geographical Sciences Committee. Dan Brown, Professor and Director, School of Environmental and Forest Sciences, University of Washington. I'm on the Mapping Sciences Committee. Uh, Mike Tischler, I'm the Director of the National Geospatial Program at the U.S. Geological Survey and one of the sponsors of the Mapping Sciences Committee. Jackie Vajunik, Geography and Spatial Sciences Program Officer at National Science Foundation. Right, and let's go around the outside of the room here. Maria Zamankova, National Science Foundation, the Computer Information Science and Engineering Directorate. Good morning, Laura Klein, State Department Office of the Geographer. I'm Hanan Samet from University of Maryland College Park. I do spatial databases and reading news with maps. Thank you. Hi, I'm Macarena Ortiz. I'm a physicist at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency uh, in research. Good morning, I'm Rachel Bernstein. Um, I'm also a scientist with National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's research office. Good morning, Mike Brady, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. I'm in the Maritime Safety Office. Mandy Bishop, I'm an engineer managing the Smart Columbus uh, uh, program for the city of Columbus. 
Gary Bergcross, formerly of the Spatial Ontology Community of Practice, interested in semantic harmonization. Rebecca Summers, GIS Management Consultant, representing ERISA today. Good morning, Elizabeth Ada with the National Academy staff. Dave Onspuck, retired member of public. Thank you. I'm C.K. Sham, I'm professor of uh, geodesy in geodetic science uh, at Ohio State University. I'm also with the uh, School of Earth Sciences. And I, it's the, I met, well, Rain and Lane about seven years. 2012. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And we recognize that, that people continue to come into the room and will be coming and going throughout the day, so thank you all for joining us. Um, oh, oh, introductions on the phone? Did you want, oh, can we have people on the phone introducing themselves? Is that possible to manage? Looks like we've been unmuted. Uh, this is Josh Murphy with the office office. Um, hold morning. on for just a minute. We're figuring this out. Uh, um, Amarita, could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Amrita Gupta. I'm a PhD student um, at Georgia Tech. Sorry, we're having a problem with broadcasting. Just a moment. I think we're just having a problem getting it to come through the speakers. We can hear her here, but. Right. Amarita, go again. Hi. Hi, I'm Amrita Gupta. I'm a PhD student in computer science at Georgia Tech, and I work with uh, spatial planning and flooding. Thank you. Uh, Frederick Chorman. Uh, Joshua Murphy. Good morning, Joshua Murphy, geographer with NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. Thanks. Mark Brune. Uh, hello, I'm Mark Brune. I'm a research GIS analyst. I formerly worked for RTI International, currently unaffiliated, was one of the uh, developers of the National Hydrography Dataset. Thank you. Pinky Mondal. Good morning, everyone. This is Pinky Mondo, Assistant Professor of Geospatial Data Science at the University of Delaware. Shalong Lu. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Shalong Lu from the Boston University. I'm now a visiting professor here, and I'm majoring in uh, geoinformation systems and the remote sensing. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Smith with DC government, and I'm a GIS analyst there. Okay. I think I think that's good. Thank you all again for for being with us um, this morning. Before we have our first session, um, I'd like to talk to you uh, with my colleague here, Harvey Miller, a little bit about our committees to sort of set the stage for this meeting and tell you what's going to be happening today. So I wonder if we could have the first slide, please. I chair the Geographical Sciences Committee, and we're a standing committee, as is the Mapping Sciences Committee, and we're both uh, committees of the Board on Earth Sciences and Resources. And the slides are coming. Great. Well, we're coming up. Yeah. Next slide, please. Uh, just to give you a sense of what a standing committee does, um, we serve, we do meetings and workshops such as the one today. We serve as a forum for engagement among federal agencies and states and non-governmental organizations and other organizations. So we convene gatherings around a theme, a topic, or a set of topics. We also do public outreach. We have webinars, uh, videos, public lectures. We will, in fact, have a public lecture this evening. More about that in a minute. Um, we sometimes provide information and testimony to Congress, and we have a presence on the Internet with our website as well as Facebook and Twitter. The main product of meetings like this is 
to find places where there's a knowledge gap or just a need for more scientific input in policy and decision making. And when we identify those needs, what the standing committees do is to convene a ad hoc committee, not of ourselves, but of a different group, and that would then produce a consensus report on really what is the state of the science on that topic. Next. Um, you've heard introductions from members of our committee. A few are not here or are not here yet. And here you can see our names. Um, next slide, please. The Geographical Sciences Committee was originally created as the Committee on Geography in the 1990s with the recognition that spatial place-based science and human environment science were of increasing importance and increasing importance in the National Academies. In 2004, the name was changed slightly to be the Geographical Sciences Committee just to um, better reflect what we do and um, that and to reflect the fact that the breadth of expertise in the areas of human environmental science and spatial place-based science uh, may extend beyond the formal discipline of geography that there are many geographical scientists out there who aren't card-carrying geographers next the mission of our committee is to provide high quality scientific, technical, and policy advice and recommendations to society and to government at all levels using the methods of spatial analysis and representation. Um, we have we have another mission in addition to our work of uh, providing science to policy, and that is in these latter two points that you can see on the screen to foster international cooperation by serving as liaison to other national geographical organizations and then finally to serve our committee is the official u.s liaison to the international geographical union and we facilitate the participation of u.s geographers in that group next just to give you a sense of the sorts of issues we work on and meet about, here is a list of some of the recent topics. Uh, land change modeling, wildland fire management, equity and access and health effects of exposure to nature, opportunities and consequences of using sensors to capture human geographical behaviors and vulnerability of U.S. energy infrastructure to coastal flooding. As you can see, um, we're, we have a wide range of topics as geography is a broad field. Next, please. And over the years, we've had quite a number of collaborators and sponsors. We are currently sponsored by the National Science Foundation. Okay, next. Okay, thank you, Carol. Um, I'm Harvey Miller, and I chair the Mapping Science Committee. The Mapping Science Committee was established in 1987 with a very simple but I think powerful and profound goal is to promote the informed development and use of spatial data for the benefit of society. And our sponsors have been traditionally the USGS, the NGA, and the uh, U.S. Census Bureau. Next slide, please. And again, this is our, our committee. Um, many of them are in the room, some of them are not or not yet. But you could see that uh, the Mapping Science Committee does draw from academia, but also um, um, or geospatial organizations and from the private sector. We really look at the intersection between science and technology and between academia and uh, the, the private sector. Next slide, please. So our meetings are usually two, two per year and here in Washington, D.C., here in the Keck Center, where we receive updates from sponsors. We have usually have public workshops on a geospatial topic and develop ideas for future workshops, studies, and outreach similar to the Geographic Science Committee. And we have, we have a wide range of participants as well, committee members, federal, state, local government, and organizations at these meetings, private companies, and also professional societies and NGOs such as ASPRS, AEG, and, uh, and COGO. Next slide, please. 
And this is some of our recent topics just in the last few years. Um, you see a lot of it centers on mapping, but also the impact of these mapping technologies on broader science and broader society, such as 2D, 3D, and 4D mapping of cities. Uh, we'll talk about 3D urban models and 3D urban models with uh, temporal expressions. Um, LIDAR, the next generation of um, LIDAR technology and how that's going to change mapping and change, uh, change uh, geographic science. Smart cities, grand challenges facing smart cities and the agency perspectives, and uh, cloud and based mapping, cl cloud enabled, excuse me, mapping science. Uh, what happens when we move mapping science, data, technologies into the cloud? What are the implications? What are the new capabilities that we can perform in this new cloud based environment? Next slide. So we'll talk now about um, today's workshop. I guess I'll jump in with that and Carol can uh, go ahead when she wants. Uh, what we're trying to do today is we want to uh, basically, as the title implies, we're looking at the federal landscape for geographical and mapping sciences. We want to generate potential topics for additional meetings and ultimately studies showcase the scope and importance of geography and mapping sciences in the, in the federal landscape, hear from agency and other public and private sector speakers about the issues, perspective, interest, and needs with respect to geography and mapping, and also provide an opportunity for interaction and collaboration among, mm -hmm. among these agencies. Next slide, please. So um, I'll let Carol take over and talk about the first session. Okay, our first session, which will be this morning, is on analyzing and communicating flood risk. Uh, this is an enormous topic and it really is central to the work of both of our committees. Uh, billions of dollars of damage occur every year in the U.S. and human lives are lost as a result of flooding. And it still happens. We should, we should be able to do better than this. And so we're wondering what societal factors affect the ability of federal and local agencies to reduce and prevent flood damages. And we chose to talk about flooding today because uh, we had to we had to have some area of focus here but we understand that whatever we learn from flooding may also be quite applicable to some of the other hazards that people face such as wildfire session 2 also this next slide please sorry Session two also this morning will be about mapping the new Arctic. Um, as we know, there's a lot of um, environmental and climate dynamics occurring at the high latitudes in the Arctic, the new north as, as described in this article in Nature from 2011. We're seeing interest, commercial interest in the Arctic, sh new shipping corridors being opened up by uh, the lack of, uh, of ice up there, uh, natural resources, and there's uh, scrambling and competition to, to acquire those. We're also seeing strategic issues, geopolitical issues surrounding US, Russia, Canada, Northern Europe, and even China are scrambling for the, at this new landscape in the new north. And there's also scientific interest, disappearing sea ice, the thawing of permafrost, changing ecosystems, and the impact on traditional cultures and the global climate. And our question here in this session is how can geographic and mapping sciences inform our understanding of this rapidly changing region and the implications for the rest of the globe? Next slide, please. In our session this afternoon, session three will be on smart technologies and communities. And these smart technologies that are being introduced into our cities and communities are profound technologies. They're going to be going to have deep changes on our daily lives, our businesses, our social practices, the delivery of community services, governance. They're going to have a wide ranging and deep impact in our communities. And one thing we'll be focused on this afternoon in particular are smart mobility technologies, ride sharing, mobility as a service, mobility beyond ownership, but actually being able to configure mobility as, a, as another type of service, and eventually connected in autonomous vehicles, more commonly known as self-driving vehicles. So these are going to really change our lives are going to change our lives on the order of how the railroads changed our lives in the 19th century and how cars change our lives in the 20th century. So we need to get a handle on these smart on these smart technologies, these smart mobility technologies. They also are are very much geospatial technologies. Smart technologies are are fueled by geographic information about sensors in the environment, and also are really are really try to shape processes and activities across. Uh, space and time. So our question is, how can we shape smart technologies so that our communities are more environmentally, social, and economically sustainable? It is unclear, like any profound technology, that it necessarily will lead to better communities. And that's something that we have to get a grip on 
as scientists, as practitioners, and as different levels of government, is how we can make sure that our communities are better in places after the better places after this uh, smart technology revolution. And that'll be our session in the afternoon. So next slide, please. This is just giving you a, a sense of our schedule. Um, again, we'll jump right into the um, human contributions to flooding session. We'll have a keynote talk about half an hour, then some panel reactions, ten, about 10 minutes each with open discussion. We'll have lunch. I guess I got the Arctic wrong one. That's after lunch. We'll have, we'll have a mapping the new Arctic, and then we'll have a keynote talk again and some panel reactions, discussion and break. Next slide, and then the smart technologies and communities to uh, wrap up our third session this afternoon. Again, same format. And then around 4.15, we'll have uh, around the room general discussion across all these topics and talk about what have we learned, what are the next steps forward, how do we continue to engage in this dialogue and this conversation. But don't think of leaving at 5 o'clock because there's more. Next slide, please. <laughs> Think about, stick around for the Gilbert White lecture this afternoon or this evening at 5.30 where uh, Buddha Baduri will be talking about synergy between geography and mapping within the nation's energy mission, which I think will be really a perfect capstone to today's workshop. So well, we're all looking forward to that, Buddha. Yeah, unfortunately for our online visitors, uh, that will not be live streamed, but the lecture will be uh, taped, videotaped, and will be on the website later on. Just as a kind of procedural note, um, today when we have our speakers and panels, we'll have the opportunity to take just a quick moment for any burning question or question of clarification right after each speaker. Otherwise, we'll move right on and we'll save those questions for the discussion period. So we have one discussion period with each session and then we have a broader discussion period where we can call everything back at the end of the day. Yeah, right on schedule. Amazing. I think we are right on schedule and I think we're ready to proceed with our first session. Great, um, and I was actually just checking my notes, but so I know we've, you know, it's sort of in, embedded in this sort of topic. Uh, by, by the way, I'm, I'm Bill Selecki. I'll, I'll moderate. Yes, I'll introduce myself. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion, even of the title, like in this kind of connection between um, humans and the flood risk question. And I know it's gone through a couple of iterations. So actually, I think what was up there was slightly an old title, and here's our new title, yes. Um, you know, analyzing and communicating uh, flood risk. So we'll have um, uh, a keynote speaker sort of present some of the, the broader the broader questions, and then we'll have two follow-on panelists. Uh, we'll do uh, about 30 minutes for the, the keynote, and then um, some clarifying questions as needed with respect to that, uh, that presentation, and then we'll go on and have two uh, roughly 15-minute presentations as well from each of the panelists with clarifying questions, and then we'll open it up around 11:30 uh, for for general discussion. So I'm really excited to sort of hear um, you know this conversation, even within the, the geographical sciences community uh, or committee. There's a lot of discussion about how to sort of frame it and sort of present. Um, this kind of question, I think, in many ways, it, as Carol has already said, it's sort of uh, flood risk. Uh, in many ways, is a touchstone to sort of looking at much larger questions. So I think that's sort of part of our objective. So um, I'll I'll just sort of present each of the uh, the panelists. Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll just do the, the keynote first, and then I'll introduce each of the panelists as we go through. So we'll have a keynote presentation. Uh, Sandra Knight, Dr. Knight, um, uh, has a background in engineering, a, a PhD in, um, in engineering, civil engineering from uh, University of Memphis. Uh, she's worked extensively, um, I think you've probably taken a look at her bio, but has extensive sort of experience sort of both on the academic, but more critically, I think, uh, professionally as well from the agency perspective. So she brings that, that kind of expertise to bear from NOAA, uh, FEMA, and the Army Corps. Um, currently, she's the, um, uh, she uh, splits her time as president of Water Wonks, um, which is located here in the city, uh, and then also has a position as a senior research engineer at the Center for Disaster Resilience at the University of Maryland. So it's very exciting to hear um, her expertise and perspectives. All right. Thank you, Bill. Um, very excited to be here this morning. Um, 
I hope I meet the expectations of both titles and the discussion we had about what I would present. Uh, the nice thing about being retired Fed and being uh, on your own is you can be a little bit of a provocateur. And so I'm going to start out with being that, I hope, and uh, get us to think. But I'm also going to share with you uh, some research I've been doing over the last year and some, maybe a big idea I have. I don't know how big it is, but we'll, uh, I'm trying it out on you today. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. Okay, so uh, we all love and hate maps, right? Uh, I, I'm not a geospatial person. I will say when I took uh, GIS in 1991, I thought, oh my gosh, it's going to save me. Uh, the, from the Mylar and USGS maps I used to have to use to get, delineate my drainage basins for my hydrology studies, right? And so uh, on the left, these are maps that people, uh, both these maps are things that people use on a daily basis, right? And I love them and I hate them. So the one on the left is, you know, your map app, right? So I want to go from my place on this map to the Kennedy Center. And I call it up and it gives me several routes. And, and I think, okay, I get it. And I push go. And then all I see is this triangle that keeps jiggling around and saying, proceed to the route, proceed to the route. And so as if you're geospatially uh, used to looking at large-scale maps, when you're then zoomed in to just a few feet in front of you, you really get disoriented. Uh, I was in a parking garage in Rhode Island um, a few weeks ago on the fifth floor, and my, my map kept going procedure rerouting, proceed to rerouting, the little triangle was just spinning like crazy, you know. So so I think when we think of these things, we have to think about the user and uh, and and uh, how, how it works. For, for some reason, I had an Uber driver. My husband and I almost always use public transportation or walk, but we were treating ourselves to ride to the Kennedy Center in an Uber. And our driver, by the way, had an app, and he didn't take any of these routes. I don't know where he was going. He went way up in, in North D.C., and we were an hour or so to get there. I thought we'd, we were going to miss the performance. Um, the map on the right is, of course, it's just a simple trail map. My husband and I go to Sugarloaf Mountain. Have any of you ever been there hiking? Yeah, okay, I love that. It's a really crummy map, right? But I keep it in my pocket because then at least when I get to the fork in the road, I can decide if I want to go a little further or a little less. I really don't can't exactly figure out if it's going uphill or downhill, even though there's some sort of topo lines. And then finally, um, I would say the map I've used the most, I moved up to D.C. in 2007, and my husband, oops, my husband and I both got one of these folding maps with the metro center, you know, the metro map, and the, I carried it with me probably for five years. I'm just now figuring out now what end of the uh, platform to stand on and what exit to get off, right? You know, so this is very useful. So for all our high-tech stuff that we do, um, we, we really, re sometimes it's simple. And as users, uh, and I, uh, the title of my presentation was Presumptions and Assumptions. Uh, which means basically there's uncertainty regardless, but presuming means that you assume that some, you, you presume that somebody has some real data and this is pretty accurate. Um, and maybe on a map like this where it's been surveyed and it's to scale, it is, but when you start adding other geospatial data, it gets complicated. So I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, to introduce this idea of flooding, but I'm going to, uh, one's going to be at a global level. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to get a little bit into Mary's space on uh, NOAA's hurricane predictions and, and the, some of that, and then I'm going to talk in detail about FEMA maps, because when I was at FEMA, I was over the flood mapping program, one of many things. So um, this is not the, the maps that came out of this study, but you, you've all probably seen this new uh, study that was in Nature Communications about the impacts of sea level rise, and that we grossly underestimated the impacts, not, not the climate science, not because of the climate science, but because of the geospatial data we used. Uh, so, uh, a lot, um, and th this means more to y'all than me because it's in my, my space, but the satellite data, data that had been used was used, uh, primarily used for these large scale looks at global impacts to sea level rise because it was a standard standard that could be used everywhere. Uh, LIDAR, Grady's here, uh, LIDAR is not available everywhere, so detailed information isn't available everywhere. So this study didn't change the climate science. But it used, it used some interesting techniques too, right? 
it uh, used LIDAR data from the U.S. and Australia, where there's a lot of uh, spatial resolution, and somehow normalized it to the, the biases that are in this large-scale satellite database. So the biases were wrong in the really worst uh, uh, way because it was all too tall. So everything, uh, uh, you know, canopies and urban, dense urban areas appeared to be higher above sea level than they actually were. So redoing the study says that, and I wrote down the cities, cities like Vietnam, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, um, Bangkok, Shanghai, Mumbai, uh, uh, Alexandria, Egypt, Basra, those, all those cities are going to experience much worse uh, impacts from just regular tidal flooding because they're, they're going to be so far below sea level. So what this tells us is when we're looking at global scales and big scales, we often use less accurate information. We try to get a common data set because we, we want it to be uh, at least that we've used the same, same stuff everywhere so that it's, it's not biased in that way. And maybe that's good for, for strategic planning or, or, or communicating something at a broad scale. Um, but at the end of the day, maybe this gross underestimation of what the real impacts of, of sea level rise are has really impacted how we as uh, nations and as, as leaders have thought about, about how, how impactful it is and how critical it is. So um, just, just a consideration. Then, uh, then I, I, am, I am a weather junkie after working at NOAA and meeting all the best meteorologists, oceanographers, and, you know, atmospheric people and climatologists. Uh, I, I'm not one, but I, I like to pretend I know a few. Or I do know a few, and I like to pretend to be one, so I watch the Weather Channel just, just all the time. Plus, I'm, disaster resilience is my gig, so I really want to know what's going on. And uh, just watching Hurricane Dorian this last time, I just kept getting frustrated. I kept thinking, we're, we're really, really, really not communicating what people need to know. Uh, we have great information. So I love, I love that we have, you know, the Hurricane um, Prediction Center has gotten so much better on its uh, hurricane tracking forecast. I like to see the spaghetti mo models myself. That really gives me a wow, look, it's kind of all over the place, but, you know, the European one's landing here and the no one's landing here. So I love that. But the cone of uncertainty in my, if I, if, uh, to the casual observer makes, gives you um, a sense of safety that's probably not there. The better the weather service gets, the narrower the cone of uncertainty. But look at the size of the actual hurricane on the right relative to the width of the cone of uncertainty. If you are, the, uh, you know, the, the casual public observer and you see this, you're thinking, oh, I'm outside of the cone of uncertainty, so I'm not going to have any impacts. And yet we know these big, big hurricanes with all their wind that they've been pushing it for days and days and days. They're gathering up more moisture with the, all these big hurricanes. We know we're going to have substantial rainfall and probably surge. And so the Weather Channel, the people show the cone of uncertainty, then they spend another five minutes explaining, well, that's really not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is probably rain and surge. But it's hard to get this information. And it's hard to understand it. Uh, so let me explain. So we saw um, in Harvey, what, 60 inches of rain in Houston. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm 61 inches. So is that what that means? Uh, 60 inches of rain? No, that's not what it means. Does 60 inches mean the creek in my backyard is going to overflow? Does it mean that it's going to be, you know, what does it mean? So what does five inches mean? Five inches can be devastating. Uh, the, I'm, I'm glad we have someone from the District of Columbia. The Federal Triangle uh, in 2006 had an intense short rainfall, and I forget what it was, but it was much less than 20 inches. And yet it flooded, flooded, there was interior flooding, right? So it can rain in your backyard, this is very, you know, random, right? Uh, and so that also gets into some other uncertainties that we, we don't really understand. Uh, we, uh, I, I'm just learning, I'm learning some new words this year. Aleatory, very random uncertainty. And that's what weather kind of is.
until we get to know more, right? And so you have these random uncertainties, but then you have also these, uh, you know, things that we introduce, whether it's through the model or through the data or the, the assumptions or the parameters in the model. So we, we, we add uncertainty to all of these products um, uh, in addition to it just being kind of weather random. And so I'm, I'm watching and I'm thinking, well, okay, I, but what does that mean to me if I live in New Bern, North Carolina? Uh, is it going to flood and our neighbor, is, is, is this going to be a problem? Because uh, we've had some bad events for the past few years, and I've, my home's been inundated before with, uh, you know, name one, Florence, Irma, somebody, Matthew, Floyd, <laughs> you know, North Carolina always gets whacked. So, so what, what does it mean to me personally? And so when we take, talk about precipitation, which is highly variable, um, putting it in terms that, that means something to, to the end user. And even to, you know, working at FEMA and with emergency managers, that can mean a different thing. I'm not specifically looking for a, a, a certain address, but I do want to know what critical infrastructure is impacted and what roads may be closed due to, due to a lot of rain or a lot of flooding or a lot of surge. And so that gets me to the map on the right. Try to find a surge map. I know NOAA's starting to put them out like 24, 48 hours in advance. Pretty crude. This is a probabilistic one and they quickly stamp guidance on it. Uh, and so if you really want to know, it's the, it's, cause we have high tide, Dorian had high tide. They didn't know when the hurricane was going to hit uh, relative to high tide that kept changing. If I'm in Charleston, I want to know how many feet above the seawall the surge is going to be. Oh, and by the way, surge doesn't even talk about the waves on top of the, the surge, right? So we really don't know how to prepare if we don't know it's overtopping our dunes or our infrastructure in some way. Um, so I do go, I did add this slide. Uh, this is yesterday. Uh, we have a big nor'easter coming through. This is, this is at the University of North Carolina Coastal Emergency Risk Assessment. This is not official anything. Uh, you have to accept that you understand that to get into their website. You have to know where to get into their website. Uh, but it's great. It's really good information. So they use a high resolution ad cert model. It doesn't run as quite as fast as the Weather Service slosh model, but it, it has more details. And it's almost at the pace where it can keep up with the next hurricane forecast. So a little different with nor'easters, they, you know, you don't have the updates like the same kind of updates. But it, you can scale in, you can pan in on this pretty, pretty close. Now, I, I would argue that once you get to a certain place, that it's going to be inaccurate, you know. So let's talk about my next favorite subject. So I'm kind of panning down, right? We kind of looked at uh, global, regional. Now. What is a flood, does everybody know what a flood insurance rate map is? Okay. So this blue outline is not a surveyed line, because if it was, we'd feel pretty comfortable about it. It's based on a bunch of probabilistic stuff, right? And then it's narrowed down to, to a, a, a point, a line, it's a base flood elevation that delineates a line. And so people look at this and they're either in the flood zone or they're out of the flood zone. And oh, if I'm out of the flood zone, I don't need insurance. And I presume this to be accurate up unless, unless I find out that I'm in the flood insurance zone, then I'm going to appeal your map because it's crummy data. Right? So, um, Anyway, so I, I, I mean, I, Ann uh, spoke to me before, and uh, the, the map, mapping the zone kind of hits a couple of points, really. One is, um, the, it was a report done by the National Academies, but this whole idea of more detailed elevation data is important. But, but no matter how good the elevation data is, this line implies that, that this 100-year um, flood is, is a single value, <laughs> and it's a probability. So um, uh, we update these things, but, but not as frequently as we'd like because uh, there's not enough money in the program. 
Uh, there's billions of dollars investment in flood maps around the United States. They're used for things they shouldn't be used for. Uh, because communities don't have anything better to use. Now, you go to New York City or someplace else, they got their own stuff because they want finer details. They're doing large-scale development. Uh, Washington, D.C. has more Im information. But you, for, for small communities, this becomes their planning tool. This is what drives floodplain management in 22,000 communities. So we need to be good at it or we need to communicate what's not good about it. So that's, that's kind of where I get that. And I do have, there, there are, depending on, this is just examples, depending on uh, the floodplain manager and their resources, they do provide more detailed information. I love DC's flood risk tool. I can type in my own address and I can zoom in and out and see what the flood zones are. But, Gosh, that alone is confusing. What's an A zone versus an AE zone versus a B zone versus an X zone? And, and what does that mean? And I can't tell you how many friends and family call me and ask me to explain it. <laughs> and it's pretty hard. And I, I kind of know what's under the hood, and it's hard to explain. So, um, so I'm going to shift gears to my, my big idea after... Uh, but first, I'm going to introduce this because I actually, uh, I am actually your second string speaker. The first one was going to be David Alexander, who leads the, the Flood Apex Program for the Department of Homeland Security's Science and Technology Directorate. And I've been working with that program for the last five years uh, in a, and doing projects, but um, managing an external review board. But it's been a really interesting uh, program and I bring it up because if you're looking for good geospatial tools and new state-of-the-art things, I mean it, it would still be worthy to have uh, David come back and talk to you. But this um, program also helps study uh, and fund something I've been working on the past year. So as a former modeler, hydraulic modeler, um, I uh, been an, an administrator of things that are, depend on models. I've been thinking about this for a long time. What is our, the quality? How do we, how is a community of practice do we evaluate our own stuff? So I'm going to kind of shift from the map, but to the data that goes on the map that's based on uncertainty and, and presumptions and assumptions and modeling. And so I had a two part study, one, the Coastal and Hydraulics Lab with the Army Corps of Engineers helped support. And I started out, and so, and then the one that uh, S&T is supporting. I've interviewed, I don't know, 70 or more people. I've hundreds of references, uh, but, but it's, and so I've kind of been collating some ideas on this. And so you, you, you're like guinea pigs, see what you think. Uh, so what do I mean by evaluation? Well, I'm calling it this. When I talk to people, I didn't want to. I didn't want to set. I didn't want to say, "What is your validation process, or how do you benchmark?" I wanted to understand what they thought quality in a model meant. So I think it's kind of any process or or check box or um, uh, that that somehow gives you some information on the quality of, of this model, the software, the data, the performance. Um, some of these methods that you use, and Mary's going to uh, talk about hydraulic, uh, hydrologic ensemble forecasting. Ensembles help produce un uncertainty. So there were some new methods I learned about. Um, methods can be qualitative and quantitative. And so uh, qualitative would be, does it have, and this is kind of commonly used stuff, particularly in the core, does it have a, uh, is it documented? Is there a user's manual? Was, there, was it peer reviewed? Uh, those are not necessarily quantitative things, um, but, but it, uh, does it, is there training provided? Is there, you know, software version updates? Those are kind of qualitative. Quantitative or, or, or Far more can be far more technical, and I could deep dive into that, but I'll spare you. Um, the point is that that anything we do to show what we've done to evaluate these models gives us more confidence in it, and it also helps us define what the uncertainties are in these models. 
So if, if I haven't convinced you that, that you need evaluation strategies, uh, that this community of practice, and by the way, there's no standard. I've talked to all sorts of people that do similar types of modeling, and it's kind of left to the individual modeler. Maybe the agency, maybe not, uh, you know, um, maybe the, the acquisition is requirements drive it, maybe not. So there is, whereas in other communities of practice, there are third party certifications and verifications, there is not one in our community of practice for, for what I would call hydroanalytic sorts of stuff. So, so if that doesn't convince you, then, then what I've heard from people was, uh, what might make them think about it is, well, well, I'm, our organization is world class. We've always been the best modelers. I go, hmm. Did you decide that yourself? Because best, best of class isn't how you perceive yourself. It's how others perceive you. And so what are you doing to convince others that you're still best of class? You know, you might have gotten a Michelin star for your restaurant a few years ago, but, you know, it's not any good anymore. Uh, so let's, you got to keep up. We have a new class of problems. So what before might have been easy enough to do with a simple lump hydrology model, or maybe we're just looking at a coastal wave model. Now we know that really what we need to do is talk about compound events. The ocean meets the river, and when these big hurricanes come in, we have a lot of phenomena going on, and these models are typically done independently. We have world-class problems about how we connect this very technical physics-based kind of stuff to socio-cultural data, to ecological data. We have world-class problems on how we look regionally, globally. Um, and so we, we have new challenges that the same old way of doing things isn't going to work. You can always, if you have some uh, idea of what the uncertainty is in your, your data and your models, that also can drive where you put resources, uh, where you're going to spend money to reduce uncertainties. Or it may decide, like on global models, if we wanted to spend our money on uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Bangkok, Shanghai, you know, the, we can prioritize what's important resource-wise. And then I, I would say disruptors in science and technology. Um, uh, LIDAR was a huge disruptor, GPS was a huge disruptor, GIS was a huge disruptor. And now we've got um, machine learning, AI, a lot of new things. We haven't gotten our arms around the quantifying the uncertainty in the way we do our physics-based stuff. And now we're going to throw in just some data stuff that, that we don't know how to quantify. And the most important thing that needs to happen is kind of this idea of transparency and collaboration. If I say my map is made on best, best available data, uh, well, you made the map in 1984. Is that still the best available data? And what was best available data then? Is it still good today? So we've got to be able to communicate that. And I'm not going to go into this, but I, I, I'm a lumper, and so when we talk about evaluation strategies, we can talk about the techie things. And that's if you talk to modelers and, and mappers, I know that we want to get right into the technical stuff, you know, uh, kind of what the, what the numbers were in that requirement. But what's the most important is actually the user requirements. And then if you want to get it done, you better have some institutional framework to do it. So I just... Flood analytics, what's it used for? Well, I started, you know, we, we, we tend to think, oh, well, we're just we, real-time forecasting. Okay, well, that's one thing. Uh, there's probably a, a, another this many more things we can use this for. Uh, floodplain management, insurance rate setting, investment prioritization. In, in the U.K., they use their national risk assessment of floods to prioritize where they're going to invest in infrastructure repairs and, and improvements. Emergency planning, uh, strategic planning, uh, project design. I want some really good stuff. If I'm uh, designing a seawall or maybe putting a nuclear power plant somewhere near the water, I better have some really detailed information. So use uh, is important. Real-time forecasting, I need it now. I don't need it next year. <laughs> Uh, so, so you've got to think about the timing, the level of quality that's needed for each of these uses, and that can be different. 
So what's next on the technical pieces? I mean, that's, that's an easy place to start, I would say. Uh, well, part of the study for the Coastal Hydraulics Lab was they're going through a process called uh, uh, numerical technology modern, modernization, and they're looking to employ things like validation, verification, uncertainty quantification into some of their hydrodynamic codes. That's a big, that's a whole new area of study these days, VBUQ. So lots lot smarter people than me can figure that out. But there's test beds we know in the weather service and others that we use those to help validate what we do. And um, and I loved uh, I loved the idea that uh, using meteorology of skill scores, and that kind of works in real time forecasting because you have every day you make a forecast you have another data set to prove if you did it right or wrong right, and so then you can decide how skillful you were at at, at predicting, but if you're doing um, if you're doing probabilistic sorts of things uh, like the flood insurance rate maps. You don't get a chance to, you know, it's hard to find out because the 100 year event doesn't happen as the 100 year event, maybe it happens as something else and it's not a smud. So you don't get to prove through skill scores, but there should, that still should be a, a consideration. There's no data, there may be for mapping or LIDAR or specific individual things, but there's no real um, data modeling standardization and certification process that I would say that's in this, this area. Um, what, what kind of performance do you want? Um, and then I'm going to, this is my last, next one's my last slide. So when I, was, I went to the UK and spent, well, I went to Del Taurus last year and spent a week with them talking about how they do their modeling. I spent a lot of time with weather service people, a lot of time with core people and other random people that would would talk to me. Uh, but the UK, I, they're, they're moving out and there's actually two different, I talked to environmental agency people, MEP people, modelers, you know, all, all rounds. There's kind of two levels of things going on there, but what, what the big idea is kind of embedded in this, what I've got next. And so, you know, that remember the Weather Service guidance, this is under construction. I'm just bouncing off some ideas just on what the construct might look like. So if you had, uh, we know that even if you get the technical stuff right, uh, so in the past FEMA primarily looks at where the highest risk areas are and when the last map was to determine where its next investment in mapping is. But it really doesn't consider things like uh, current community resilience. You know, remember I said places like New York don't need your updated flood insurance map. They've got better data. But communities that don't have it uh, or communities that are rural or that have never been mapped. So you need to build, it can't, you can't just uh, rate your ideas based on one technical thing. So I have this idea that you could use, um, and th they're doing this in the UK, they have a confidence um, uh, index that they're building, and it's just for the data input model performance. But they give, under each of those categories, they have subcategories, you know, the modeling input, how accurate was the precip weather, how accurate was the, the elevation data, what were the initial parameters, how were they validated, and then performance, did it meet certain, you know, marks, and, and is it uh, high performance computing, you know, is it efficient, you know, all those sorts of things. And then uh, for each of those elements, they rate them whether from good, you know, from one star to uh, bad or poor to very good. And then they have a composite score called a confidence index. And that way they can then tell the public that your map, your model area and your region is a two or five. If it's a two, this is probably good for maybe some general planning activities and to consider, you know, where you might want to make uh, further investments in data. If it's if it's a five, man, maybe you can, you, need, you can go ahead and use it. You don't need to invest more in reducing uncertainty. You could probably use this for most of the things that you want to use it for. So it's just it's just an idea. So. But I, I didn't want uh, the rating just to be solely on uh, technical pieces. I think there's aspects of community resilience, like if you look at um, societal, um, the social vulnerability index that Bill and I were talking about earlier. Uh, what is the capacity of the community and the, its users? And then, uh, then we uh, we don't FEMA maps, for instance, really aren't funded to consider climate change, even though they should. Can we think should. about that? What that means? So do we have 
do we have an option to, to actually? Okay, sorry. Uh, I, I'm almost done. Anyway, so, and then economic development, could we rate how, how these, these might be used in quality of life? So it's just a concept I'm starting to pull together some of the details up under there. Just another thing to think about today, not, not su suggesting that we adopt my concept, just how, how do we frame this? So that's, I think I'm still on here. So uh, we actually have a moment. If anyone has a, what we're trying to do here is any clarifying question, like a question that was unclear or a piece of information that you, you need to sort of, you know, think about the, the presentation. Maybe just one or two quick ones, and then we're going to move on to the panelists. So we have uh, one here. Just a question about yeah. um, data and models and how we're defining. Oh, sorry. Uh, could you introduce yourself. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Dan Brown, University of Washington. A question about data, mo data and models and how you're defining them. I, I like where you've gone with the thinking about assessing and how they're useful, data yeah. and models. As we move into questions on the right-hand side of this last slide, economic development, human response, right. human vulnerability, that implies different kinds of data and models than we started with, which right. was terrain models and hydrologic models, which are useful for engineering solutions, but not necessarily for social solutions. So just a question, how do we define the necessary data and models in this case? I, I think that is the question, right? And that we know, I said that we're getting, we have complex problems now, and they can't be solved by just looking through a technical lens. So I think in some cases we do have some of this data. Um, um, we do have the U.S. Global Climate Change Assessments, and if, if they were incorporated into our precipitation forecast or, or hurricane forecast, we do have um, some information on where things are developing, uh, you know, uh, where cities are growing, you know, Detroit or some other small city. You always see that in the news. There are There is some information out there, and the social vulnerability index is, is really quite widely used now. And so it may not fall under a B.C. ratio, benefit-cost ratio, and so we got to get beyond that. And you could add weightings. You could argue what the index could look like, which parameters you would use. So, But that's a good point. Okay, great. I want to, one quick comment, if you don't mind. Harvey Miller from Ohio State and Mapping Science Committee. I just want to point the, the audience to a MSC report that we produced in 2009 called Mapping the Zone, which actually looked at the uh, inadequacy of land elevation data to determine if buildings need flood insurance. So it's a 10-year-old study report, but I think it's still very relevant to this conversation. Yeah, I mentioned that, and it, it is. It stayed on my desk the whole time I was at FEMA, and it's still in my office, yeah. Uh, great. I think we'd like to move on, um, if that's okay. But certainly, sir, uh, keep your question, and we'll, we'll bring it back into the larger conversation. But thank you. So we're going to actually move in through now the two panelists. So the idea of the panelists um, would be to um, both sort of provide their own insight into into some of these questions, uh, further some of the conversation, broaden in some cases, narrow as well. So we we have two experts. Um, we'll have uh, first Mary Maluski, um, who currently serves as the chief of Water Resources um, Service Branch in the uh, Analyze, Forecast, and Support Office. Makes a long title um, of the National Weather uh, Service. Uh, so she oversees a lot of the weather service plans and uh, policies and procedures for water uh, resources, warning, and forecast operations. So bring stuff right from the the the, uh, the very sort of front line. So Mary, uh, about 15 minutes, and then we'll also clarifying questions as needed. Do you want me to stand up there or sit here? Um, the chairs, either. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And it's obvious. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Mary Molesky. I'm Chief of the Water Resources Services Branch. I realized that I started my, my slides more in the where we're going and not so much the what, where we are today. And so I just wanted to take a minute with, with how we communicate flood risk, how we analyze and communicate flood risk today. And primarily it's use of polygons and points. We have polygons, um, flood warnings or flash flood warnings, and we have point-specific hydrologic forecast data at rivers. So we, so we have about 
4,000 locations across the country that we're producing daily forecasts at um, that we provide a river level and, and the river flow for the next either three to seven days, depending on how confident we are in the precipitation forecast. Um, the polygons are primarily, we're comparing the amount of rainfall to some, some of the hydrology that we've modeled for that large basin hydrology. If we think that it's going to exceed that, we, we, we issue the warning um, for either a flash flood or, or a, a aerial flood. So what, what happened in basic, and we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so right button. Right button. Right button. Thank you. Wasn't so obvious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back in 2012, there were beginning to be a lot of issues, uh, too much water, too little water, poor quality water, and Congress recognized, and, and there are 24 federal agencies that have some fingerprint in water, and Congress recognized that we could do more if we, we could better serve the public if we work, to get, work better together. So they asked the IRIS agencies, the Integrated Water Resources Science and Services Agencies, which is the Army Corps of Engineers, NOAA, USGS, and FEMA to go out to our stakeholders and ask what else, what other information do you need? And so we started this in 2012. We started first with being directed to go to the Mid-Atlantic um, River Basin Commissions, and we were very focused on River Basin Commissions at that time. So we went to Susquehanna, Delaware, um, Potomac, and, and uh, New York, uh, the Hudson River. After that, they asked us to expand to other parts of the country. So we went to the Ohio River Basin and the Russian River Basin. And recognizing that the, what we were hearing was primarily river focused, we also held a flash flood summit as the IRIS agencies um, to understand what the needs were for flash floods. And what did, whoops, that's, I hit that again. All right, I'll get it next time. Where's the bottom one? There you go. There we go. Okay, so what did we learn? Um, Really, we heard, we heard that flooding is still the number one priority, that our, our stakeholders absolutely need flooding information at, at all time scales and spatial scales. But they also need water quality information, water availability, availability information, drought information, and they need that information all in the context of a changing climate. And they need that integrated understanding. It's not, it, you were talking about having separate models. It's not, we, we have separate models for flooding. We have separate models for water supply. We need to integrate that because our users are making integrated decisions. They're deciding today if we build, build a community for 20 years from now, how that's going to impact the flooding, the water availability. So they need an integrated understanding of both the near-term and the long-term risks. And they want that in a very high resolution in space and time. Um, and, and they want that information to be linked to all sorts of intelligence information like infrastructure, economic, demographic, and environmental information. Because what they ultimately want is actionable information information that they can make decisions on that can, that can help th their communities. I'm going to get it right this time. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so that led to two major investments on the weather services side. One is the National Water Model and the, the second is the Hydrologic Ensemble Forecasting Service. So what is the National Water Model? It's a continental scale, high resolution in space and time, hydrologic and, and hydraulic water um, physically based model of, of water parameters. And it gets us that integrated understanding. It's, it's good from droughts to floods and it's, um, and it's everywhere. It's based on that NHD plus uh, infrastructure. And so it's being able to commute those water resources parameters at every single grid scale down to 250 meter grid scale. Um, so what you're looking at on the right there is the, um, the red points are those existing points where we provide river forecasts and the blue are the streamlines for where we can now produce information based on the national water model. So this was based on our, what our stakeholders were telling us. They were telling us they wanted this integrated understanding. They wanted it from floods to drought and they wanted it um, from summit to sea. So, so we began implementing this in August 2016, and as I said, it goes from floods to droughts, um, and it really provides that, that information at those underserved locations, those locations where we don't have forecast points today, the, the, where the red dots are. There's a lot, of, a lot of space across the country that is not served by those red dots. Um, it produces a spatially continuous national estimate of all of our water resources parameters. So everything in the hydrologic cycle needs to be represented in this model. And it implements the modeling architecture that allows for rapid infusion of new science. We're still working on that. We're trying to get into a community, more of a community-based model where we can have more of a sandbox with a plug-and-play capabilities. But the idea is to get there so that academia and other components, other federal components could, could then help to improve the national water model. And it really is, is 
um, the, the foundation for improved growth. Like we know that if you, if you look real close, we don't, get, we don't get very close to the coast. We don't have that coastal connection. But what this provides, the National Water Model provides, is a capability in a consistent way to connect to ad circ models, to be able to represent the coast and, and the riverine components together. Um, so the National Water Model, to meet a variety of different users, is run on a bunch of different scales. It's four different scales, and those are the, the rows that you're looking at now. So the first scale is an analysis scale. It's the current conditions, and it basically looks back either um, the last three hours or the last 28 hours or the last 12 hours and builds, and builds um, to, to the current time, and that provides the best understanding of what the current conditions are. The next, the next um, cycle is a short-range forecast. So we produce this hourly and we go out for the next 18 hours. And so that's going to inform more of your flash flood decisions, um, much of that um, fast responding. The next is the medium range, which we, we run four times a day and it goes out for 10 days. Um, and so that's more of your the flooding in the next in the next three to seven days. What you're concerned about, and then the final one is a daily daily model a, a daily run that goes out for 30 days, and that's used for more of the water supply type of questions that w that we're trying to answer. Great. Thank you. The other investment is the Hydrologic Ensemble Forecasting Service. And what you see here is for those 4,000 locations that we today we provide um, river forecast using a lumped hydrologic model, what we're trying to do is account for the, for the uncertainty. We know when we put out a river forecast for the next three to seven days, there's so much uncertainty in the rainfall, in the hydrologic models that we've used, even in the observations. So what we're trying to do, and you see it on the left, the left there, is show the range of possibilities for a forecast. And so for the locations in green, we have currently implemented um, the Hydrologic Ensemble Forecasting Service. The locations in purple, they have been implemented, but they're displayed slightly differently because it's more of a water resources customer out in California and not the 10-day forecast. And then the locations in blue are where we're working to validate the, the techniques today. And we're continuing to expand the hydrologic ensemble technique over the next, uh, the next two to three years, where we hope to have a, a base um, coverage of the entire country. So what we've learned, though, is now we have a um, we have a fire hose of information between the National Water Model and HEFS. There is a lot of information. And how do we make that useful for our, for our stakeholders? So we went back out to our stakeholders to ask that very question. And we went to, um, in 2017, we did a number of forums where we had integrated stakeholders. So we had across a spectrum of water resources managers, emergency managers, fisheries, um, different, different people. And then in 2018, we went to much more partnered uh, specific topics. So we just went to emergency managers and asked them what they thought of these products and data. And we talked to our own forecasters of what information are you communicating? What are some of the gaps in that information? And what we came out with is a logic model. And it's a very busy uh, picture. But what we're trying to show here is that we need to provide information, if you're looking at, uh, down the columns, at three main categories. We, if you look all the way to the right, we have to, we have to provide information for the high flow flood risk. That's, that's the number one piece of information that people come to the weather service looking for. We also, in that middle column, need to provide low flow information. And then also we need to have just general map services, maps, forecasts that we provide every day for maybe a navigation or a water supply. They need to know what the forecast is regardless if it's flooding or drought because they're making decisions on how much to load the barge or how much to, how to operate that reservoir. We need to provide that information. At, now I'm going down, down uh, the scales. We need to provide it at national levels. We have national customers like FEMA who's looking to pre-position resources all the way down to neighborhood details where we have an emergency manager deciding what road to close and so how to have actionable information at, at that level as well. And also if you go across the bottom, we need to provide this information at many different timescales. We have, we have users who need it in the next 18 hours because they're making decisions on do I close this road out to the, the next the, the daily time step to the weekly time step out to the seasonal time step where we're making water supply decisions. And the other pieces of information in those blue boxes are the pieces of information we need to communicate with our forecast. It's not enough for us to put out a streamflow forecast. Our users want to know what drove that forecast. What was the precipitation that went into that forecast? What was the soil moisture? How did, does it, they want to do that intuitive, does this forecast make sense for my application? Oh, thank you. 
Um, so now we're trying to flesh out that, that logic model and try to put in some of that information that we provide today and what information is coming in the future. So now I'm looking at, if, if you remember the logic model, all the way to the right at the national scale. So I'm talking about flood risks at the national scale. And so we have a number of things that we can do today at our point fo forecast. We could provide the observed conditions at our point forecast. We can provide a, um, we can provide the forecast over the next three to seven days. We can provide forecasts at those points for um, the next 30 to 90 days. And then we also have the seasonal flood outlook, which is our first guess, our first look at what's going to happen this, at, at, for the spring flooding um, and be able to communicate that at very national levels. And then we see some of that national water model filling into that information. So we have a modeled soil moisture of the current conditions. We have an 18-hour streamflow forecast or a 10-day streamflow forecast or a 30-day streamflow forecast and how that can fill in and provide other information. And then if we're looking at that logic model down at the local neighborhood scales, um, there's a lot of information. And, and as Sandra was saying, that flood inundation mapping is the, is the number one information. So we, ha we have techniques today at 150 locations where we use very similar mapping technologies to FEMA with uh, um, hydrologic and hydraulic models to provide flood inundation maps. We also can go to the, the new national water model and using a more approximation approach, be able to provide that for across the country. And that's what we're beginning to explore are now using the height above nearest drainage. It's not nearly as precise as what FEMA has for the regulatory maps, or it's not nearly as precise as what we can provide with the hydrology and hydrology, hydraulics, but it's a first guess. And sometimes when, in, when there's nothing else, that first guess is, is mean, very meaningful information. We have our hydrograph that we provide at 4,000 locations for the next three to seven days. We have our ensemble forecast providing that range of possibilities, and we have seasonal forecasts. So what's next for us and where we're going is trying to validate these, these different services and see what, is, what provides our users with that actionable information, what makes sense, what helps them make the decisions that they need to make. Great. Great. Um, yes. So I, I do, uh, I'm sensitive to the time, so um, we wanted to try to start discussion at 1130, but if there's a, like a burning, clarifying question, um, we can pause for a moment. Otherwise, I'd like to bring Burl Amans on. Um, let, me, let me do that, if that's okay. Um, so let me introduce Burl Amans. Uh, I've known for a long time, a, a, fellow, a fellow geographer. Uh, she's at the Depart oh, yep, Department of Geography, Planning, and, and Environment at East Carolina University, and she's the co-director of the uh, university's Natural Resources and Environment uh, Research Center. Um, written widely on a number of, of topics. Dr. Mons's uh, work, particularly in the context of natural hazards, looks at the question of the effects of flooding on property values, perceptions of risk and responses to warning and vulnerabilities of communities. So certainly um, kind of wraps on many of the issues that we've already been touching on. Thank you, and I'm delighted to be here. I'm hopeful that this social science perspective um, adds to the more scientific natural science, hydrologic science. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about, as you can see, vulnerability, perception, um, and response, which are really broad topics. So I'm going to try to do it in 15 minutes. Bill will shoot me if I don't, so I will I'll get it done. Uh, but they are very broad and complex topics, so bear with me as I just sort of scratch the surface. At the outset, too, recognize that both vulnerability, yep, Vulnerability and perception lead to response for better and for worse, and that's what we're going to be getting at. So when we look at vulnerability, um, we think about the physical environment. So we've talked about exposure already, um, exposure living in an unsafe place. So um, you can see the houses that are pictured here in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Smartly, they have elevated some of these houses uh, in order to reduce their exposure. Susceptibility is a different issue with respect to the physical environment because people who live there are not equally successful, susceptible to harm. These folks who've elevated are less susceptible to harm than others. Um, and we'll talk about, I'll just talk briefly about each of those again. And then vulnerability is also defined by the socioeconomic uh, situation where individuals um, and communities, however you define communities, are not equally, do not have equal coping capacities nor adaptive capacities. And I'll talk about some of the factors that influence that. 
So we know flood exposure in the United States. This map of cumulative claims of insurance shows where we have high flood risk. Where there's a lot of flood insurance claims, there's a lot of flood, in, flood risk. So we know this, right? We know where the exposure is. It may vary locally. It may vary from time. It obviously varies from time to time. But we have a good sense of what our physical exposure is. I'm, I'm thankful to Sandra for mentioning <clears throat> New Bern, North Carolina, because this is New Bern. <clears throat> and while we know that exposure, um, this is a very busy map, I recognize, but I think it gets at susceptibility because it looks at um, water infrastructure in New Bern as it is susceptible to storm surge, uh, sea level rise, and riverine flooding, and suggests that even if, for instance, those houses that I showed you that are elevated, might not get flooded directly, they may not have clean water. They may not have access to their, let's put it this way, they may not be able to flush their toilets well. Um, so again, that susceptibility is separate from exposure, but, and it, so we have to think about it in a broader perspective. And then we have the socioeconomic situation, <clears throat> and I listed here a dozen um, factors that influence uh, vulnerability of individuals and communities. The SOVI method was mentioned. Um, that's a useful method in mapping. However, um, there's two issues associated with that, and that is the scale at which it is, the spatial scale at which we map, and the temporal scale at which we map, um, because communities change, neighborhoods change. And so if we're using census data, which I love, don't get me wrong, um, but if we're mapping census data in 2018, well, does that really tell us what the neighborhood or what the region is like in 2018? And these do not, these are um, not in mutually exclusive criteria, right? So, um, for instance, age, much of the research shows that the elderly, I prefer to call it particularly mature adults, <laughs> and the very young, so the, the, the older and younger are um, more vulnerable because of their um, relative inability to perhaps protect themselves, that's a gross generalization. On the other hand, particularly mature adults may have more experience and therefore might would make better different decisions based on that experience. So these are interactive um, and they will obviously influence one's both perceptions to an event or to the risk of an event and their ability to make certain responses. So again, I'm not going to go over those. We'll, you'll see them again. Um, and I want to go to perception. Um, perception is a really complex criterion. It's a really complex concept. Um, it consists of our judgments, beliefs, and attitudes. And how do we measure those? How do we find those out? We know we can ask people, but we know that sometimes what people say and what they are really thinking or what they're going to do are very different. So we have to think about those, but, but obviously how we um, perceive our risk is going to have a big influence on our response. Now recognize that um, our perceptions derive from cognitive factors, how we view the world, how we view our risk, and I'll talk about a few of those in a minute, but also our situations, right? We may view ourselves to be at risk, but we don't have transportation to evacuate, for instance. Um, or we don't have anywhere to go. So while we may perceive ourselves to be at risk, we don't take action because we can't. So vulnerability and perception are integrally related. And both of them are influenced by knowledge and they influence our knowledge. So we, we do know things. So <laughs> there, that's a whole other layer on this diagram. Um, <clears throat> but both of these uh, influence response. I'm just going to um, dig a little deeper into the cognitive factors. So just to give you an example of um, psychological uh, element within the cognitive factor, um, the locus of control was uh, it was a concept or a, a, pro, yeah, a theory that was developed in the 1960s by Rotman, and um, it still sort of holds today. The locus of control is one where some people tend to be more externally oriented, where they sort of believe that they don't have a lot of control over their fate. And others are more internally oriented, where they tend to say, I can control this, I've got this going. Now, it isn't quite as black and white as I suggested, but I think that it gives you an overview. Um, and attitudinal, we have different outlooks on life. Some of us are more optimistic than others. Some are more pessimistic than others. Some of us are more risk averse. 
while others are more risk-taking. So those are kind of our outlooks on life. And we also make decisions within certain biases. So um, some people are really wedded, uh, wedded is the wrong word. Some people have the anchoring bias where they rely on the first piece of information, right? That's the one that really grabs them. So um, that's the one they're going to make their decision on. Or a confirmation bias where you focus on the information that confirms what you already believed. And there's a number of others. I won't go through all of them. But I think that this uh, <clears throat> this table uh, that came from some work done following Hurricane Sandy by folks at Yale and other institutions um, looks at that. If you just look at the, the difference between the 21 percent who were the first out and the 22 percent who were the diehards, think about um, their attitudes toward their outlook, their biases, their locus of control, right? So again, I think that this really gives us a good sense of how perception plays out um, in, in our responses. And of course, these are people who had the opportunity to evacuate. <clears throat> these are ones who had the choice. Their vulnerabilities did not hold them back from evacuation. Um, and so we're looking at response. So I'm going to deal with warnings. Uh, what do we know about messaging? Because if people don't take action unless they're told to, mostly. Um, so we know that people have trusted sources. And Mary, I promise you, the Weather Service is truly a trusted source. One of the best. Everybody says that. Having said that, <laughs> the role of official advisories is limited. People always look for additional information. So they might go online to look at the Weather Channel to see if what the Weather Channel is saying is the same as what the Weather Service is saying. Um, friends and family always have something to say about this, or people will rely on what they say. You might call your family member who's the weather geek and ask them, or the one who works in the weather service. And then there's the environmental cues. For a long time, no matter how much technology we have, people use what my colleague Eve Grunfest and I call the stick. People go out and look at either the stick or the rock in the river. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what's going on, what the Weather Service is saying, they're going to go see where is the water on the stick or the rock that they're used to looking at and how fast is it rising. That's um, one of the things on which they make their decisions. Um, so one of the issues is we need the right messages through the right channels to the target audiences. Yeah, that's way easier said than done. What is the right message? What are the right channels? Those are the things that we're still trying to work out. Um, and the message alone, again, is unlikely to spur action. That, and those environmental cues are really important. And that doesn't matter whether it's floods. With tornadoes, people go out and look at the sky because they get a tornado warning like, oh, it's sunny out. Why would I worry about this? Um, so again, those environmental cues and the I influence of family and friends is also very important. And there's a lot of talk about the cry wolf syndrome, if you will. Um, yeah, it sort of exists, but it's overstated. Uh, much of the research shows that, you know, people do look for other information. People do take environmental cues. So while maybe cry wolf, some people say, well, I didn't do it last time. It didn't happen last time the way I said. And in fact, that might have been a problem with Sandy and Irene. Um, some people did say that, well, they got it so wrong with Irene, they must be wrong with Sandy. Uh, but a lot of people didn't say that. So again, it's, it exists, but it's probably overstated. Um, and complicating factors. I, this diagram is like my first map, the map of New Bern, I'm sorry. Uh, but this is, shows the diversity of decision makers. This is a diagram that um, comes from some work that we did, funded by NOAA um, a number of years ago, that looks at the center of it is emergency managers. And once they get a briefing from the Weather Service, this is how it goes out. These are all, this is the, you know, it's like that telephone thing. If we said something and went around the room, well, this is what happens. And, and people take that briefing or the information that they get and some ch take things out, some add things to it. So think about how that might change as we have this diversity of decision makers with a diversity of needs. Obviously, there's uncertainty inherent in the warning. So how do we present that uncertainty? And the hydrologic ensemble forecast system, I think, is a really good way to, to get at that. The key is getting people to understand that. The role of lead time. We've often talked, heard that the longer the lead time, the better. Well, sometimes that isn't the case. The longer the lead time, well, now I can go buy beer. 
Now I can go, you know, we talk about winter storms, right? And we have what we call French toast syndrome. You go get milk, eggs, and bread. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, a long lead time might lead people to do the wrong thing. On the other hand, think about the diversity of decision makers. Emergency managers need a long lead time. Talked about storm surge, for instance. Um, emergency managers in the Outer Banks of North Carolina want to know what the onset time is of tropical storm force winds because they have to have everything evacuated and all their equipment away by then. So they need a really long lead time. Others maybe not so much. Um, and obviously the context in which the warning is received. So where are people? What are they doing? What are they thinking? What are their responsibilities? So some factors that influence response. Um, so we know from the research that those that influence response positively is that trusted source of information. Higher income suggests a more positive response to take action because they can, they're less vulnerable. They, have the, they don't have those vulnerabilities that say they can't evacuate and so forth. Having children in the home for which you're responsible and having strong social connections and networks. Just some of the things that suggest positive responses to um, warnings, for instance. Negatively, the sense that the home was safe. Every event's different, but that experience may work, and we'll see that experience works both ways. Um, traffic concerns for evacuation, for instance. People are concerned about delayed reentry, or they're going to get caught in traffic anyway. Um, work responsibilities. My boss won't let me go. I have to be at work. Um, and pets. And while we've had some initiatives that have <clears throat> um, tried to help have shelters where people can take pets, some people are not either not aware of them or still aren't going to aren't going to go. So we know that those negatively affect response. And then here's the great news. Um, it might go either way. Experience, well, I've experienced the big one. I can handle anything. Or I experienced the big one. I'm never going through that again. Uh, the estimation of the threat. What are people's perceptions of their risk? The cost versus the benefits. And that is the perceived cost versus the benefits, like the traffic concerns and delayed reentry versus having your kids at risk. So what, what are you going to do? Um, your location information, how you understand your location compared to what your, the information you're getting. And then friends and family can help you or hurt you, I'm sorry. <laughs> so what are the takeaway messages? Um, the message matters, but some won't hear it because they're not listening or they don't have access to the information. Some won't understand it, maybe because of the language, that's, the technical language that's used, or it's not in a language that they speak or that they understand. And again, we're making strides toward that, but it happens. And some won't heed it. Uh, and there are many re reasons for not responding. Um, some can't. They have vulnerabilities where they simply can't take actions. Uh, and some won't, because their perceptions, their understandings, and their experiences may lead them to say, this isn't a big deal. I don't need to do anything. Um, and they have, might have a lack of awareness of the risk that they actually face. And then there is that whole issue of hubris where I won't go there. Um, and in a true academic, here's my references. And thank you. Great. Great. Thanks. Um, so I think in some ways that the three presentations, I mean, again, sort of the objective here is really to sort of think about some of these thread points between the Mapping Sciences Committee and the Geographical Sciences Committee. And I think these three presentations together sort of illustrated a lot of those interesting potential areas of overlap or existing overlap and opportunities for, for others. So we have uh, till noon uh, for some, some Q&A. What I'd like to do is to throw it open for, for questions. I think um, if the chairs, co-chairs are okay, maybe take two or three in a, in a bundle and then sort of um, rather than one by one, um, just I sometimes feel that you get more, more questions and then the panelists can, and, and keynote can sort of reflect on them. So maybe uh, while we take uh, uh, two or three immediate comments uh, and then the panel can respond. So gentlemen in the back, sir. And if you could introduce yourself. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, C.K. Shum from Ohio State University. I'm a geodesist. We're on sea level and coastal zones. Uh, this is very eye-opening, very interesting for me to see how geospatial geodesy actually could extend to so many applications. So I have, actually, I'm a technical person, so I want to ask like two technical questions. The first one is for the first talk. Um, very interesting. Um, so. If I like to uh, ask, for example, commenting, so this measuring of the digital elevation model, right? 
so I think our technology will require us probably uh, to better forecast, storm surge, sea level rise. You will have to measure the changes, the changes with adequate spatial west erosion along the coastal regions, for example. And in the ocean, um, I think the, the first priority against technical command is probably to do hydrography and measuring the perfumetry. And we're not going to be able to actually, in my opinion and knowledge, at this point to measure changes of the perfumetry. For example, sediments froze down, the changes. So your, your, your model will be off. Um, so the, the, um, the second, the, let's see, the, the second question is for just a simple question for the national water model. It's very interesting. I wonder whether you will consider like groundwater groundwater actually uh, maybe even transporting nutrients and some other um, phenomena like for example near the lake uh, with uh, phosphate and which causes harmful algal bloom and so on. So these are just the technical questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other sort of immediate uh, questions to bring forward just to sort of bring um, a cluster of things? Yes. Please introduce. Yeah. Yes, hi, I'm Grady Toole with 3D Ideas, member of um, Mapping Sciences uh, Committee. Uh, question also on, on your presentation, Sandra. Uh, I, I think very, uh, very generally is excellent uh, ideas to uh, quantify uncertainties through the entire decision-making process, if, if you would. Uh, but I think what you were getting at was essentially to ultimately put uncertainties on these um, um, uh, on, on the actual maps, right, in the, in the end. And I'm just wondering if that doesn't uh, sort of transfer the problem from uh, where we drew the line as to what the, what the height was to what the probability of, of uh, flooding actually is, and then uh, how, do, how does that get resolved? So a flood, a flood uh, insurance company uh, is going to make a decision based on a probability is that, is that uh, sort of the direction you're proposing? Yeah. It's a question for you. Thank you. And, and I would sort of translate also into Burl's presentation, like the sort of ranking, how would people perceive that, you know, as questions. So those are three, um, two from the gentleman in the back, and this one here, um, questions that sort of bring up a lot of the issues. Maybe we'll pause here, let folks respond, and then take another set. Microphone. Uh, good questions. Okay, I don't know that I have answers, so you, you uh, <laughs> folks help me. Uh, I, I just told you I was going to be a provocateur. I didn't say I had answers. Uh, so the DEM piece, going back to mapping the zone, what we learned from that National Academy study was elevation, 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 right? And so we know the more accurate the elevation information, the better quality we have. And it's also true, and I agree with you on the first question, um, things change, so particularly coastal zones, but also rivers, and so um, even if you have good LIDAR data, uh, thank you, Grady, um, it changes with every storm, and so being able to get information before and after storms is, is a goal, but it's not doable in uh, all parts, I mean, it is, it's not affordable in all parts of the world, so and even in places in the U.S., you can't always get that it's that the technology may not work. Bathymetry is absolutely what you can't see is as important as what you can see, uh, particularly when you're doing hydrodynamic modeling, right? And so if we know that, that uh, I mean, uh, coastal surge is really driven uh, by the shape of the coastline as well as the bathymetry. So we, we tend to funnel this water up through our estuaries and up into our rivers. And, and uh, riverine uh, modeling is really focused, uh, uh, I mean, I know national water model is high above near its drainage and there's very little resolution inside the channels. But if you want real information about where to dredge or where to place your port or where to, where flood, where to put flood protections, you really do have to have detailed information. I, I think um, from that perspective, there is a lot more that we can do. I, I think we have technology that can do it. Uh, it's a matter of how much we're willing to invest, and that's why I think you have to think about these investment strategies of where it's more important to get the best data you can. I'll let, and 
So, so I'll speak to the national water model and where we're going with the groundwater um, and other advancements. Um, as I mentioned before, we're, we're trying to look into um, deconstructing the national water model into its components and, and creating a sandbox so that people can play in there and put, you know, plug and play a different model or a different capability. And definitely groundwater is one of the, one of the areas that we know needs improvement um, for the, uh, the, our low flow estimates. So that, that's certainly an area that we want to explore. USGS is working on more of the, some of their groundwater models and how applicable that those would be for a national implementation. We expect others to be more appropriate in certain areas. So, so we do see some growth in that area. Um, we want to move towards modeling uh, stream temperature as, as a precursor to some of the water quality parameters. If we, can, if we can get into that area, then maybe expanding into some of the other water quality, like sediment loading and um, those, those sorts of questions. Uh, the question of un uncertainty, it, it, well, do you want to go take that first? Or, well, it, that's certainly something that we hear it, as, we're, as, we're putting, as we're issuing flood inundation maps, um, that they want to know how confident we are in that map. And, and for us, it's a forecasted map, so it's, it's based, the confidence comes from how confident are we in the precipitation, how confident are we in our models, which, have, which are our approximations. One of the things that we're talking about is stitching together a model that we would use um, our hand technique where, where, there is, where there are no other models, where there's nothing better. But we would use other techniques like the Army Corps of Engineers um, models where they have projects. They would have the best models at that time, and so we would use inundation mapping from there. And then we would use the more um, at, very, at specific river gauges, at the USGS gauges, where they have a hydraulics and hydrology study. We would want to be incorporating that as the best model there, so kind of making the best best of maps map um, to communicate that flood risk and, and then doing other things like communicating the maximum extent rather the, the you know, worst possible case to, to certain people because um, we recognize the, the social science challenge of that. The emergency managers want to see worst, worst case, but they don't want their people seeing, the, the people in their communities seeing that worst case scenario. You want to react to that? <laughs> But actually, this is about communicating risk, and I think you probably have the better insights. But, I, I, but back to the <laughs> back back to the flood map, and do I want to see a probability distribution on it? I don't think so. I don't think people will understand that. So, I, what I'm saying is, though, when we put a line on a map, then it's like it's like if you surveyed my lot, it's like a property line to me. You know, I, as a consumer of this product, now believe that that's the truth. Uh, and only the truth. And so, uh, furthermore, it doesn't really, it really doesn't speak to your risk because the 100 year flood is only about the hazard itself, not the impacts or the consequences. So, if we talked about having a consequence map, I don't know what that looks like, maybe that would be different, uh, or just Forget the probabilities at this point and just say if you had if if you know the forecast is going to be a foot above mean high high water level whatever that is then and that it's going to be in my backyard so you know the depths maybe you just put depth of flooding or um, that that could occur for certain events but I think to the simple public not not that the star rating but we are used to that right travel advisory the Michelin stars if we had some simple way to start thinking about it now I'll also flip that and say FEMA and I don't know what's under the hood yet they're just rolling it out but risk rating two that FEMA's putting out is about the perspective for each home so it will be what the what the actual risk is for that home. So even if I'm inside the special flood hazard area, uh, my footprint may uh, may be a certain size. And so if I have a big home, big expensive home, I should have uh, you know to pay more insurance, right? And if I'm above the the base flood elevation, I should I I, I should get a break. And if I'm below, so they're going to rate it based on the structures within the thing. But I still don't think it speaks to risk. It speaks to the hazard. So, but communicating risk, I think Morel should answer. <laughs> Well, I agree about probabilities on a map. I think yes. that, that that won't work, although maps work, and AHAPS is really helpful um, to have people understand their risk. Um, and not everybody, a lot of people really who live in flood zones do understand their risk. Um, you know, some of the work we've done in, in um, eastern 
Pennsylvania, for instance, in the Delaware River Valley in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, they absolutely understand their risk. And they have the stick and the rock and they look at the hydrograph and they look at AHAPs and they look at everything. So they do understand it. So you have the other problem is that it's not just when we're looking at decision makers, it's not just the public versus the officials. There's a whole range of publics out there and they have very different perceptions and very different understandings of probabilities. Um, the other issue is that, that Mary brought up is the, and I think we see this with the HEFS, the Hydrologic Ensemble Forecast System, is the statistical problem uncertainty versus the forecaster confidence. Mm -hmm. And they're two different things. And um, so people want confidence. They want to know how confident the forecaster is in his or her forecast. Um, they sort of want another statistical probability, um, and we're trying to figure out how best to, to um, put that out there. One of the issues is that the Weather Service faces is as soon as you put something on the Internet, everybody has access to it. So you don't want to confuse those who don't understand it as well as, as others. So if you have something for emergency managers, if it's confusing to the public, that can create more problems than you really want. So there are those issues. Um, but you're absolutely right about the flood maps, too, that I think probabilities won't work. But then um, there are things where I remember um, I used to be at, at Binghamton University in New York, and it flooded a lot in the region. And uh, I had one student who said, well, I didn't think I was at risk because I wasn't in the floodplain. The map told me I wasn't in a floodplain. This was a geographer. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, she was an undergrad geography major. Does that work? <laughs> Great. Okay. So maybe we'll take uh, some more questions. So uh, uh, here, and then come up here. Uh, yeah, Harvey. Yep. Um, I assume you need. Yes. To yes, I know. <laughs> Harvey Miller, OSU and MSC. I w I'm wondering whether or not there's other ways that we can use geographic information to help people imagine these risks. For example, I was reading a book recently called The Optimist Telescope by a former Obama um, administration official who talks about how do we get people to think more long term. And there was an example where they gave people, they put some people in a, in a virtual reality environment and, and they got to see themselves older. And then they asked them later on um, about um, preferences for saving for retirement, and they had increases preferences, preferences, attitudes towards saving for retirement after imagining themselves older. I also read, heard something in the news recently about climate scientists who are using VR as well to try to imagine, well, what will your city look like in 2050? So I'm wondering whether or not we can talk about going beyond just these probability maps and these flood maps to try to create imagined futures that really resonate with people as to this is what the world will look like in the future under under this this particular trajectory we're following. Okay, uh, Dan. Uh, Dan Brown, University of Washington. Um, I wonder. I, I've heard recent reports about the disparities and inequities in re flood response, such that uh, those who have more value on land get more payout from uh, response programs. And I wonder the degree to which. Um, certainly that's a, an element built into uh, flood insurance programs uh, and who, who pays, who can afford to pay, who knows. But I wonder to the degree to which geographic information and the availability and perception and value of that information feeds inequities and disparities in outcomes. Okay, great. So, I mean, stretching the, the envelope a little bit, both both questions in some ways. We also have a question online I think we want to take as well. I'm Simon from the Boston University, and I feel very interested in the presentation of Mary Mosulistai, ASCII. And uh, I think the, for the national uh, water model, there, uh, there is a big system with a lot of uh, field uh, observation data and remote sensing data. So my question is, uh, uh, this kind of data from different departments, what kind of the cooperation strategies between NOAA and uh, like, like USGS and other uh, uh, institutes or universities? And uh, that means how satellite data and the field observation data integrated uh, in these big systems? And uh, another question is, uh, what is the accuracy of the system? Because uh, we have a lot of uh, forecasting functions. If this re uh, result can, uh, can occur, uh, accept for the people's uh, requirement, that means are there any successful cases uh, can prove for this uh, forecasting model result is correct or not? 
Yeah, that's uh, all my questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. So uh, the questions kind of cluster together in this idea of like, how do we stretch out? Like, in, you know, it's a different context, n different technologies to sort of look at some of the questions, issues of equity, and also, of course, um, uh, inter interagency collaboration. So um, a nice, a nice uh, thicket to go through. And I'll throw it open to anyone. <laughs> so. Um, I'm going to start with the second one on the flood payouts and and the the inequities there, and, and I'm sure these they can contribute too. So it's true, right? Uh, and and a lot of it is because of these social vulnerabilities. Uh, people, let's let's look at home buyouts that might be accessible to people. Uh, first, there's some really stupid rules with them with some of these programs. Good intentions, but bad rules. So substantial damage. What does that mean? You know, uh, it's a stupid 50% cut off. You know, it makes no sense. Uh, you, if if you got 25% substantial damage, then you're not eligible. But your neighbor might have had 50% substantial damage, and they are. And we're all in this together, right? We're a neighborhood. We're a community. We're we're doing buyouts one one place at a time, and it's not. We're not considering the the the. A social cohesion of that neighborhood and that group. So we miss that opportunity. Plus, we wait so long. So one of the reasons, uh, you know, more um uh, affluent communities have uh, more political savvy. They can get their act together and c come up with proposals to submit for grants. Um, bigger infrastructure and in, uh, that protects hot more. Uh, important costly neighborhoods ends up with the BC ratio that's better than in poor communities and mm. and we we've seen it play out everywhere but we certainly saw all of this play out in Puerto Rico and um, unfortunately people are not getting the money in time what money they're getting isn't justified now there, there's arguments about uh, whether they even deserve it because it was informal settlements and not you know they can't show a title uh, some buyouts have been halted because uh, uh, just they don't have access to someone to do title insurance. You, you have to you have to move the deed over to somehow. So not having access to the resources you need to actually carry out this this information, much less understand what the process is and how you get in the queue. So there's a lot of problems, and uh, they're 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 not related to maps. They're related to the policies that we we have been implementing for a long time. Having said that, I think they could be related to maps in the sense that we know enough about where people live and what their risk is that we could map, um, and we do map who lives where, and once it's flooded, we can say here's what where they are and then devote the resources to those areas where, for instance, the um, marginalized or disenfranchised populations exist um, and, and to send resources there to help them navigate the systems. Um, so I think that, because that's really part of it is navigating the bureaucracy in time to get the kinds of resources that are needed to, to recover or to move or to adapt somehow, right? So I think that we have the we can map it, but why not use that mapping to say, here's where we need to devote our resources, rather than those who, as you say, have the political power and can pound their fists and say, I need it now. Can I, while I have this? Please. What the heck, I got the floor. <laughs> um, a virtual reality, I think, is a great idea, uh, because we've got to get people to understand what their risk is. And, you know, if the AHAPS maps work, virtual reality is going to work better. I mean, AHAPS, they can see what's going to flood under certain circumstances, just in a 1D kind of thing. But um, being able to see it in a 3D would be very useful. The trick is getting people to, it, it's time consuming to get to do that, but I think it's really useful. Um, and one of the issues when we get back to those cognitive biases, one of the issues is a, a, bi a myopia bias where we tend to think short term and very narrowly, and that would, I think, ex help us to avoid that, that bias. So I think it's a great idea. Um, I just think it's really hard to implement and, again, maybe prioritize places where it's absolutely critical. And of course, for now, until the technology advances. Exactly. <laughs> And I'll, I'll just say I, 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 I like that idea too, but I think um, when we added to our 4,000 locations where we provide river forecasts, when we added impact statements to what would, what would be impacted at what level, it changed response. It, it changed how people responded to that. When we added pictures to that, it increased it again. So getting to that next level, making it as real as possible, gets to that actionable information. 
Just Same question. Um, I, I love. Uh, it took me a long to, time to go away from paper to, <laughs> to online newspapers, but it's fabulous because you get all these cool graphics. And so, what well, we've seen emerge, you know, in the Washington Post, the New York Times, are these graphics editors that take our brilliant data and put it in ways that that communicate to the public. And I love it. Uh, but I'm not sure. And so, I think they they've come up with some smart and clever ways. And, and you will talk to some scientists and say, well, they didn't get it exactly right. Uh, well, that's okay. They did communicate something. But I, I would also argue that virtual reality, the access to these kinds of resources, not everyone has that. And so how, how do we make that more accessible to people that don't have access to those sorts of things? Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to address that third question, um, which was the accuracy of the National Water Model and the data interoperability. We have been working with the Army Corps of Engineers and the USGS um, for decades we, to, to do river forecast. We cannot do river forecast. The Weather Service cannot do river forecasting without the help of the USGS with the gauge locations and without understanding what, how the Army Corps is operating their reservoirs. Data interoperability is, is key for us. Um, it's been so for decades when it was when we were on the phone communicating information, paper trials. Um, it's just getting better and better with, with big data, with interoperability systems, with data services. We, we have access to USGS data in, in a much faster way. The Army Corps of Engineers went to their core water management system, which is more of that data services capabilities. So I, I see that as a growth area. The, the, the more we can communicate in data services, the more they can communicate in data services, the more we can make those available to everybody in data services will help will help the growth of that in terms of the evaluation we're always looking for ways to evaluate our our models uh, there's lots of opportunity with just observations um, but as I mentioned before the the, the USGS it only has point point observations at about 8,000 locations across the country and now we're we're trying to simulate stream flow at 2.7 million stream reaches so Mil millions of stream miles. Um, so it's, it's hot, hard to do a, a evaluation verification, but that information is different than what's, it's something that's never been there before and providing a service that's never been there before. So we're looking for ways, can we use satellites, can we use drones to, to uh, evaluate some of our, 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 especially the flood inundation mapping, um, but definitely having those real-time observations and, and assimilated into our models is something we're striving to do. Great. So maybe uh, looking at the time, we'll take these last two questions and then um, responses, and we'll probably press up toward lunch. But sir, and then back. Yep. Uh, part of my job is. If, if, if you could uh, press your little uh, red, then introduce. I'm Mike Tischler at the Net, uh, National Geospatial Program at USGS. Uh, I'll be talking about the Arctic, but a big part of my job is producing a lot of the topographic information for the country. So the uh, 3D elevation program collects LIDAR coast to coast. That was stood up, I think, in response to issues like mapping the zone. Uh, flood mapping and FEMA is a big partner of ours, and, and we also produce a national hydrography data set, which fits right into the national water model. So it's really fascinating to hear the conversation, and I just want to make a quick comment about where we're going with both of those. Uh, you mentioned NHD+, Plus. Uh, in addition to groundwater, which is a terrifically difficult problem, we're also working on how to capture uh, the, the urban stormwater systems as part of the surface water, particularly in urban areas where people live that's very, very complex, and not all the cities have the same information. And we've had a, a good, successful pilot in Washington, D.C., where they did have good data, where you've been able to integrate the urban system into the surface water network. With the 3D elevation program and LIDAR, uh, you're right, refresh and, and measuring change is hard, and it's expensive. But once over for the country, is supposed to be about a billion dollars. Uh, we're working with, with NOAA uh, on a study to figure out what the next generation of that will be, incorporating more coastal information, bathymetric data, and inland bathymetric data across the rivers. It all starts with a good justification and a return on investment, so we can talk to the legislators and, and talk to other stakeholders to recoup that investment. I think we've got a good model. That's what we did with the 3D elevation program, and, and we put over $400 million over the past five years into LIDAR collection across the United States. We want to be able to do that on the coast so that you can have bathymetry data to, to, to help inform a lot of these systems and models. That's just the once over, though. How do you do it again when you need it? Uh, the inland bathymetry and the coastal bathymetry has a much shorter to uh, shelf life than topography in Utah. Um, okay. Well, last, I think, um, or last question before uh, before lunch. 
Okay, yeah. So th- this is really interesting, and the comment about virtual reality and everything. I'm me. sorry. Uh, could you introduce? Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm Glenn McDonald from UCLA. Um, the comment about virtual reality got me thinking a little bit. But look, when we present a map we're, to someone, a user, we're at least of a, of a risk or hazard. We're at least two steps of abstraction away from their usual reality which is when we're looking at the world in a plain view. And then we're trying to then, on top of that, put some color, color coordinating or something. It gets very confusing for people. Now, I'm thinking about public, you know, private partnerships and stuff. Google has spent a lot of money driving cars around that take pictures of the street, right? That, that's how people see their environment. They see their home. And um, for real estate, you know, you use that a lot in the MLS for the street view of your house and all of that. It seems to me that we would be able to provide a model of where the flood water is going to be relative to those streetscapes. And people could just simply type in their address without having to put on a virtual reality hat and see what their house might look like based on the best projections we have. It doesn't seem to me that that is any stretch of current day technology. And it's the way people are accessing information. I could grab this out and I could see what my house is going to potentially look like. Now, I understand there'd be legal ramifications and things like that, but there is a huge data set that's out there. There, Google's put a lot of time and energy, as has various real estate firms, into these kind of geo-reference databases that take you out of the bird's eye view and put you on the street. So just just a thought. It's actually that Google was a partner to do something like that and uh and i think they there was people saw them t- going around they were getting ele- first floor elevations and um that got some le- had some legal ra- ramifications so um north carolina does an excellent job they have detailed data on all their their structures and i don't know that they uh how they look at depth or what their websites look like but they have the information where people could look i think the heart uh so i think we're close we've got to get past some of the legal issues if we had structure by structure information which they'll need for risk rating too and for some other things that would be great being able to visualize Visualize it as another thing, but also adding this real-time forecasting back to the issue of what does five inches of rain mean at my house or in my neighborhood? We're a long way, I think, from getting to that place. We might can take a statistical storm or a statistical event and say, well, if you're if you're uh, if a hundred-year event were to occur, your water would be this many inches under, you know, or something. But the more real-time piece of it is a long way away. Any other thoughts or reflections? Maybe to sort of close down the panel, any sort of comments or questions or things you want to put? Otherwise, maybe I'll put it back to the co-chairs to close us down for the day or the morning. Well, thank all three of you very much for your presentations this morning. And we're now going to adjourn for an hour for lunch. We reconvene at 1 o'clock. And does the staff, does anyone want to comment about the lunch? There's a cafeteria two floors up. The elevators are just around the corner from where you came in. Um, And there's an open cafeteria as well as an atrium um, to enjoy lunch. And and then we'll reconvene in here at 1 o'clock. What floor is it on? It's on the third floor. Um, Somebody somebody will be in the room the whole time, so yes. Okay. Yeah,